بسم الله والحمد لله والصلاة والسلام على رسول الله وعلى آله وصحبه ومن والاه أما بعد السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته We hope and we pray that everyone is doing well inshallah ta'ala today um, We will continue from where we left off before So we started already the regalia of being chivalrous And chivalry which in Arabic is al muru'a And we discussed a lot of these things um, and we said how it's subjective, how it's a form of ihsan, going beyond what's required, being extra kind, extra careful, etc., extra courteous. Um, this means <coughs> the traits of chivalry include bravery, forthrightness, meaning forthrightness, meaning you're always honest, noble manners, giving for the sake of good causes, putting on a smile no matter what, spreading the salam. We talked about this in the boycotting. And that there are indefinite boycotts, but however, that a person should try to spread the salam. We got two traits of chivalry. And so there is a question which is, if a person isn't naturally chivalrous, meaning they don't have muru'a, uh, naturally speaking, and it, it, it comes difficult for them to have chivalry, to have muru'a, can they gain it through practice? And by the way, this applies not only to muru'a, to chivalry, but it also applies to any good trait. Naam? Uh, yeah. No, no, uh, just keep those ones off. Yeah, you can turn off, no, no, the first row. Aywa, that's good. That's okay, yeah. Um, so in terms of any, any good trait, any good mannerism, can we gain it through practice? If we're not born with it, can we gain it through practice? Yes, we can. Okay? So there's obviously, this goes back to a debate of nature versus nurture. Now, there are people who naturally will be more generous than other people. Khalas, this is their tabr. And nurture is in Arabic, tatabbur. So we have at-tabr'u wa tatabbur. Tatabbur is to develop that good nature. Tabr is to have it, to be born with it. Right? Because on some, for some reason, people are brought up in a certain environment and they gain it. And then later on, you kind of have to combat that, you have to fight it, you have to develop it, you have to train it, and so on and so forth. But we do believe in Islam that these things can be developed. But subhanAllah, some people are born with more generosity than others. Some people are born with more courage than others. Some people, khalas. But that you can develop this courage later on. You can develop this generosity later on. There was a Muslim scholar, shh, boys. There was a Muslim scholar in the past. He was traveling in the desert. Okay? And he's starting to run low on both water and food until he comes upon a house. And he comes upon this house and he says, you know, I'm going to go, I'm not going to knock on this house and I'm going to ask them for food and water, for help. Because... Islamically speaking, if somebody comes to your house and asks for food or water, Islamically speaking, can you tell them no? No, you cannot. You have to give somebody food and water. If somebody comes and asks and they look like they do actually need food and water, give them food and water. Okay? In fact, a daif, a guest, has the right to stay at anybody's house up to three days. Up to three days. Now obviously if you don't need to stay there for three days, you don't have to. You, don't, you shouldn't. Meaning you shouldn't be a burden on people when in fact you do have a place to stay and whatnot. But Islamically speaking, we are encouraged to host people up to three days. Khalas. So this man goes up to this house. This is especially the case back in those days when there were no gas stations on the highways. Right? There's no hotels, every you know, city. Khalas, it's just houses here and there. And so Islam encouraged this good habit in order to assist any traveler that's traveling. Okay? So he goes to this house, knocks on the door, a woman answers. And he tells her, you know, my sister, I'm, I'm, I need food and water. Is there a man in the house? Can he, you know what I mean? Can you help and whatnot? She's like, my husband isn't here, but you can stay in our guest room. We have a guest room. Stay there. And I'll place some food and water for you and you can yeah, and enjoy it. So that way yeah, they're maintaining proper Islamic etiquette and whatnot. He goes into the guest room and uh, he sits down. He's about, he's starting to drink some of the water and some of the food when 
the man of the house shows up, the husband. And he sees this guy there, he gets upset. Not because he's there, but because his wife gave up some food and water. Why did you give this guy food and water? Don't you know that we're running low anyways? Blah, blah, blah. We can't afford to just give everybody who comes by food and water. And he gets upset at her. And all of this is happening in front of the man. The man becomes shy. And then the guy tells him, Hey, you, leave. You need to leave my house right now. He gets kicked out by the husband. <laughs> he barely drank some water, some food, and now he's out. What the heck just happened? I get kicked out. He can't say no. And he knows the Islamic ruling, but خلاص, this is his house. You can't, yani خلاص, the sin is on him. Okay, he leaves. <laughs> the wife was very generous. The husband super stingy. He leaves. He walks for another, he says, a few minutes, 15, 20 minutes. Comes upon a second house. And he goes over to the second house, knocks on the door. A woman opens the door. And she says, can I help you? He's like, you know, I'm a traveler. I don't have any food or water. Can you spare me some food and water? No, go. We don't have any food or water. Go, get out of here. What the heck? <laughs> he starts to turn around and leave when the husband, the man of the house, shows up. And she says, hey, sorry, excuse me. What's going on here? He's like, you know, I asked the lady for food and water. He's like, no, 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 don't pay attention to her. We have food and water. Come in. So the husband takes him in sits him down in the guest house, in the guest room, and brings him food and water, and is sitting there with him. And the guy, the scholar there, he's like, man, I've had this craziest day today. He's like, what's happened? He says, you know, not too far away there was a house, and the lady gave me food and water, but then the guy came and kicked me out. And then here, he's like, I'm sorry to say this, but you know, your wife, or whoever it was that's with you, wanted to kick me out, but then you were very generous to me, and you're giving me all this food and water and whatnot. The guy who helped him said that the lady who helped you in that other house is my sister. And her husband is my wife's brother. <laughs> they come from a very stingy family. And he says, we come from a very generous family. He's like, I grew up and my parents taught us from a very young age to be generous and giving to your guests. He says, unfortunately, my wife and her brother grew up in, a play, in, a, in, a, in, a, in an environment and in a family in which giving was not recommended. And he's like, I've been trying to work on my wife, but it's been very difficult. <laughs> to try to teach her to give and to be generous and not to fear yani, that Allah Azawajal will replace it or that He will protect it or that He will provide. So the scholar took from this is that sometimes it's very difficult to get rid of that thing that you, were, you, you grew up with. Khalas, this is how some people, subhanAllah, grew up with. This doesn't though negate the fact that you can develop these good traits. So with regards to chivalry, chivalry is very difficult. And that's why we're talking about it here. Because muru'a, like we said, is going the extra. A lot of people might say, you know what, I, 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 I'm going to do the minimum and that's it. I'm not going to be more generous. I'm not going to be more brave. I'm not going to be more accommodating, more polite, more kind. Khalas, I'm just going to do what the minimum is and I'm going to move on with my life. Chivalry entails that the seeker of knowledge goes beyond these things. Which means that for some people it will take more effort to develop. Some people, alhamdulillah, they grow up in a household. They're born with those traits of chivalry. It's very easy for them. For other people it's very difficult. But like we said, it has to come through practice. This is why this hadith of the Prophet ﷺ is very important. We're going to mention two hadith about this. The Prophet ﷺ says, إِنَّمَا الْعِلْمُ بِالتَّعَلُّمْ وَالْحِلْمُ بِالتَّحَلُّمْ He says, knowledge is gained through learning. I Meaning you have to practice it. You can't, you're not just born a knowledgeable person. Like we said, there are some things that a person naturally has, but knowledge is not one of them. Yes, you might be more smart, but nobody is born a scholar. Nobody is born memorized the Qur'an. Right? Nobody is born knowing certain things. So the Prophet is saying that you can never, ever say that I am naturally not a learner. This is false. This is why the Prophet he says that knowledge is gained through you practicing the act of gaining knowledge. You can't just say, well, I'm naturally this and that. No, no, no. Maybe naturally you're more inquisitive, yes. Maybe naturally you like to, for example, ask a lot of questions, yes. 
But that doesn't mean that you're going to be naturally more knowledgeable. No, knowledge only comes through practicing it. And forbearance only comes through practicing it as well. Forbearance is where you're forgiving and you're accommodating to those around you. It's al-hilm. And this only comes through practicing it. Meaning people aren't born naturally forgiving. Right? We have to practice forgiving others in order to gain it. And the more you practice it, the more you gain it. And the easier it will be to actually be more forbearance or to have more forbearance. Prophet Muhammad also says in this hadith, وَمَن يَسْتَعْفِفْ يُعِفُّهُ اللَّهِ وَمَن يَسْتَغْنِي يُغْنِهِ اللَّهِ وَمَن يَتَصَبَّرْ يُصَبِّرُهُ اللَّهِ وَمَن أُعْطِي أَحَدٌ عَطَاءً خَيْرًا وَأَوْسَعَ مِنَ الصَّبْرِ He says, whoever is chaste or chaste, Allah will grant him chastity. And whoever is content, Allah will grant him contentment. And whoever is patient, Allah will grant him patience. And no one is given a gift that is more accommodating and better for him in this life than patience. What the Prophet ﷺ is saying is that a lot of people are like, you know what, naturally I'm so impatient. Do we hear this all the time? I'm naturally so impatient. And the Prophet ﷺ is saying that this is false. Patience is gained through at tasabbur which is the practice of being patient. If you're impatient, that means that you were never trained to be patient. Which is why in our schools and in bringing up our youth, we have to teach them patience. Discipline, self-discipline has to be something that we train them to do. Because otherwise they're going to grow up and they've never practiced it and therefore they're not going to have it. It's not that they were born this way, it's that they were nurtured this way. It's begotten through practicing patience. And the same thing, all of these things, being chaste, protecting yourself and your honor is gained through saying no, being chaste. Being content is gained through practicing that content. You eat your share, you know that one piece of bread is enough for me, I'm going to eat one piece of bread. You know that two pieces of bread is enough for me, I'm going to stop at two pieces of bread. You know that three is enough for me, I'm going to stop at three. But you can't say, you know what, I'm just going to eat and eat and eat. No, you have to know your limit. Same thing, yani, in contentment, in whatever it is, in patience, you have to practice it in order to gain it. And there's another element to this, which is that whoever practices it, Allah will give them more of it. If you're doing it for the sake of Allah. So if you're practicing patience for the sake of Allah, Allah is going to give you more patience. Does that make sense? So the more you practice any one of these things for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, Allah will give you more of that thing that you're trying to practice. Okay? Any questions on any of these ahadith? Okay. There are the traits that are the opposite of chivalry. This is where a person has inappropriate friends and company. The company that you share will show what type of person you are. So if you're a chivalrous person, but you have company who they themselves are not chivalrous, this is the opposite of chivalry. So a person needs to be very aware of what type of company I have. Who are my friends? Are they themselves practicing these traits? Inappropriate work and hobbies. Obviously part of chivalry, part of muru'ah, is that you have good hobbies. You can't have a bad hobby in the sense where it demeans your character or points to something that maybe people don't respect or don't like about you. Same thing in your line of work. Chivalry entails that you have a respectable line of work. Now we don't mean by this like you can't work, for example, as a person who cleans or a person who is a... No, no, no. These are completely fine. It's in your dignity and your honor and the way you carry yourself. But you can't sell, for example, something haram like a person who has an alcohol store and then say, well, I'm trying to be chivalrous. No, no, no. Or you open up a nightclub and you say, I'm being chivalrous. This has nothing to do with chivalry. Okay? Avoiding inappropriate places. Obviously, part of chivalry is that you have good character. And good character entails that you're always found in good places. And so nobody would find you in an inappropriate place. You avoid self-adoration. Part of chivalry is putting others ahead of yourself. Which means that a person should not practice ujb. Ujb in Arabic is what self-adoration means. Meaning you're impressed with yourself. And this self-adoration will be exemplified in the person praising themselves, talking about themselves, etc. etc. And this is obviously and you're not recommended in Islam. 
And that's the opposite of chivalry. Also, showing off along the same lines. A person cannot... Chivalrous is, like we said, putting others above oneself, and therefore showing off is obviously the opposite of this. Rejecting the truth. All of these are, by the way, from Bakr Abu Zaid's book. He's listing these. And I'm just yani, translating them, putting them in this order. He says, rejecting the truth. Part of chivalry is that you humble yourself for the truth as well as for others who carry the truth. And so if a person cannot humble themselves to accept the truth, then the opposite of that is rejecting it. If you find a person rejecting something, even though that it is true, then this trait is the opposite of muru'ah, of being chivalrous. And obviously the last one is being rude to others. Rudeness and being crude is, is the opposite of chivalry as well. So what this entails is that there's a balance that's needed in muru'ah. In everything that we do, we need a balance. This means, and this is what he says, the author, a person should be proud without arrogance. Proud means you don't demean yourself, but arrogance is where you start to put others down. And there's a balance. Because you shouldn't humiliate yourself, but you shouldn't be too arrogant as well. You have to find a balance, and there's a fine line. You guys understand this. There's a fine line between being proud and being arrogant, and you have to find that line. Arrogance is when you reject the truth, you belittle others. But being proud is that you're not putting yourself down either in the process. You're not humiliating yourself. Prophet Muhammad he says, لا ينبغي للمؤمن أن يذل نفسه It is not befitting for the believer to humiliate himself. So they said, Ya Rasulullah, how can he humiliate himself? He says that he burdens himself with a situation that he cannot handle. He puts himself in a difficult situation. There's a fight going on, I put myself in the middle of that fight, when I have no business being in the middle of that fight. As an example, this happened, and the person gets humiliated, because both sides are rejecting him. They're like, why are you doing this, why are you doing that? Okay. <laughs> so you have to understand what you're capable of, and what you're able to do as well. Being polite without being prude. Prude is where the person goes beyond politeness and starts to put himself down. But polite is where you're accommodating others. So you should accommodate others, but not at the expense of your own dignity. Okay? Being humble without demeaning oneself. All of these are on the same lines. I can't put myself down and humiliate myself, but in the same self, I have to be humble and whatnot. Being forthcoming. Forthcoming is telling the truth, being honest with others, without being naive. Naive is where I'm being fooled by the person I'm dealing with. This is why Umar عنه, used to say, Lest al khib, walays al khib wa He says, I am not a, a deceiver, but a deceiver can't fool me. I can't be fooled. Right? There are some people who, yani they themselves, they don't deceive others, but they can be very easily deceived. They're very naive. And he's saying that part of chivalry is that you're not naive. But at the same sense, you're not always assuming that people are lying to you. Because unfortunately there are people, because of out of fear of being taken as a fool, uh, they will what? They will assume that everybody's lying to them. And this is the opposite of muru'ah. They start to investigate everything that the person says and question them on everything that they do. And this is completely wrong. This is the opposite of chivalry. So we have to assume that people are correct, but we have to also be very smart about what's being told to us to understand that, okay, maybe I'm being fooled here. Okay? Smiling without being a fool. <laughs> Unfortunately, some people avoid smiling because they think that they're going to be yani, looked at like a fool. But the thing is, the Prophet ﷺ smiled more than anyone else. And obviously, he's the farthest thing that we have to a fool. Which means that we ourselves can smile, and we can smile politely and forthcoming without looking like this. Being noble without overzealousness. Noble means that you know where you come from. You know your family, you know their history, you know your reputation, that's fine. But it doesn't cause overzealousness to where you become proud, where you say that, no, my family is the best family, my ethnicity is the best ethnicity, my skin color is the best skin color, my heritage is the best heritage. No, this is all false. That's asabiyya, which is overzealousness. Asabiyya is where the person has a sense of, you know, uh, ethnocentrism, nationalism, all these things to where it's incorrect. But a person can be proud 
of his origin and whatnot without demeaning others. And this is why he says, you have nobility without overzealousness. And then he says that you stand up for your principles without them being the wrong principles. If you have principles that you know without a doubt are the correct principles, okay, then you should stand up for those. But you shouldn't stand up for wrong principles. A lot of times we do stand up for wrong principles. So one time I had, um, this was back in Utah, and um, we had Sunday school as well. We had many kids that came to the Sunday school. And there was one group, they had about, I want to say, seven or eight kids in our Sunday school. All of them were cousins, the kids. So their parents were siblings somehow, yani, or, or cousins themselves, or whatnot, but they had, a, they had a large group. And one of the kids got into a fight with another kid. And this kid from that big family was at fault. And so the kid's aunt came, and she wanted to discuss what happened. So we explained to her, like, look, he started the fight, all these things. She's like, no, I reject this. I said, why? She says, because we have a principle that family comes first. Always. And I said, that's fine, but you shouldn't put that principle above the truth. <laughs> you should support your family in making them follow the truth, not just supporting them blindly, no matter whether they're right or wrong. And she told me, no, you're wrong. Family is always number one, and I'm offended, and this and this and this. And eventually she tried to talk all the rest of their family to take their kids out of Sunday school. Out of this one principle of family is always first. Do you understand this? That's a principle that she held on to. But that principle is correct, but it only comes after a few other principles. <laughs> like the principle of truth like the principle of integrity, honor, etc., etc. This is why Prophet Muhammad himself, he says, Unsur akhaka zaliman aw mazluma. He says you should give victory to your brother, whether he is zalim, he is an oppressor, or he's being oppressed. Whether he's an oppressor, you should give him help, or he's oppressed. So the Sahaba were confused. They said, Ya Rasulullah, we understand how to op- yani help our oppressed brother. Right? By, by removing the oppression. But how do we help the oppressor if he's our brother? The Prophet ﷺ said, you stop him from his oppression. You stop him from doing what's wrong. That's how you help him. Not that you help him further that oppression. And so a lot of times people misunderstand this. The Prophet ﷺ is encouraging us to be good to our families and to say, yes, family comes first. But family comes first in correcting my family. Not that I go with him no matter what. There's not a single human being who I will ever tell that to. You can't, because that human being will make a mistake. And so I have to say, no, I'm going to stop you when you make a mistake. That's how I'm going to support you. But anyways, that's the principle. Okay? Continuing the balance of chivalry. Being brave without being careless. Because there's a fine line. A person can say, yes, I'm going to be brave. And then they go and they do something very stupid. And they're careless. And they lose their life. Or they lose, yani they injure themselves. Or the, for the sake of bravery. Bravery ta- entails that you think before you act. That's being chivalrous. But you shouldn't be careless with regards to the bravery. Being generous without ignoring one's responsibilities. So if you do have responsibilities, those come first. You can't say, you know what, I'm going to be generous like that Arab. There was an Arab Bedouin, right? Who was very known for his generosity. And he had one camel left. And this was the camel that he used to ride on. And somebody came and said, are you so and so? He said, yes. Are you the very famous generous person? He says, yes. He's like, I'm coming, I'm your guest. A guest, ahlan wa sahlan, come. He gets off of his camel, slaughters it right there, and feeds it to the guest. Lost all of his money. And in fact, because of his generosity, they used to make an example out of him. Because of his generosity, he actually died out of hunger. Because he, he rejected the idea that he should ask anybody for help after this. This is in the Jahiliyyah days. This is pre-Islamic ignorance days. Islam doesn't teach this. <laughs> if that's the only camel that you have, keep it. <laughs> be like, Ta'ala, I'll be generous. Yani, I'll go and sell it and buy something else and whatnot, but I'm not gonna... You understand what I'm saying? Being generous entails that you're also aware of your responsibilities towards yourself, towards your household, etc. And then after this, you can be generous with whatever you want. But there's a fine line. There are people who are completely ignorantly generous, and out of and sometimes foolishness, foolishly generous. Now, generosity is a good trait. Prophet Ibrahim 
in his story with the angels that came and visited him. The angels were on their way to destroy the people of Lut Qawm Lut, because of what they practiced, right? But before that, they came to him and they, were, they visited him in his house. And they said what? Qalu salama. Qala salamun qawmun munkarun. He said, salamun, people, I don't know who you are, but come in. And then as soon as he sat them down, made sure that they were comfortable, faragha ila ahli. This word in Arabic, faragha ila ahli, means he snuck out. So that the guests aren't aware of him leaving. Snuck out, slaughtered a calf, a young male uh, cow, uh, a calf. Slaughtered it for them, prepared it, brought it back, and give it, gave it to them. And they said, this is a sign of true generosity. What is it? Is that he didn't ask them whether they are hungry or not. He forced them into reality. Here's the food. If you want to eat, eat. If you don't want to, that's okay. But it's here. Because if we ask before we bring, it's as if we're hesitant to even bring it. And they said, according to culture, according, this is specifically Arabic culture, right? According to this, is that that's actually a sign of stinginess if you ask before you bring. You need to bring and then give them the option at that point, not the other way around. And that's what Ibrahim salam did. That's why he went and prepared the food and then brought it and then, okay, if you want to eat, that's great. If you don't want to, that's great. Do you guys see this point? That's true generosity. So when we get guests over, we shouldn't ask them, hey, would you like to drink anything? No, no. You should bring the drink and then let them choose. Do you guys see this point? That's the difference between being accommodating, being generous. Because a lot of times if people ask you, can I get you anything? You're going to be like, what? No, 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 it's okay. It's okay, it's fine. This is why there was a funny a guy who came from the Middle East. He's used to that. If somebody asks you, you say what? No, 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 it's okay. Out of being polite. So, does everybody know this? Somebody asks you, hey, do you want anything? No, 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 it's okay. Immediately, why? Because you're being polite. You don't want to burden them. Even though you might want it. So the guy came from the Middle East. He's used to doing this. He goes and visits his American white friend. And he's thirsty. Outside it's hot. It's in the summertime. And he's thirsty. He wants water. And his friend brings him over to his house. And he's like, hey, can I bring you like, some water or anything? He's like, no, 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 it's okay. So the guy's like, okay. He sits down. And the guy is like, what? You're sitting down? You're not going to offer me again? Like, I need you to offer me a second or third time so you know, I can say finally yes and give in and then you can bring me the water. But he just sat down and he's surprised. He's like, oh man, I'm stuck now. And he sat there for the rest of the time, you know, embarrassed and thirsty because he didn't want to burden him with more. <laughs> right? Does this happen? <laughs> so what, what we're saying is that we have to just offer. I mean, not even offer, bring it. Bring the water and be like, here you go. I'll pour you some. You know what I mean? So that way, khalas, they're compelled. Um, and that's, that's, like we said, true generosity. Very good? By the way, I wanted to make a point of this. Generosity is not just with wealth. Generosity is not just with wealth. Generosity can be with time. Generosity can be with status. There's a sheikh, uh, Sheikh Salah ibn Najid, he says that every person owes zakatul jah. He says the zakat on status. What is zakat on status? He says that a person has a certain jah, a status in the community where he can get things done that other people cannot. He can talk to people. He has a connection with people that other people cannot. And he says that that person, because of his status, owes it to the people that don't have that status to get them those connections and to help them out with whatever they need. Somebody needs to do a business deal. Somebody wants to buy a car. Somebody wants to get married. They go to the person with the status and they say, hey, can you talk to this family for them to marry us their daughter, for example? Then he says, yes, I will use my status for that purpose. And he goes over there and he talks to that family. That's what he calls zakatul jah. It's a zakat on your jah, on your, on your status. There's a zakat on knowledge. The zakat of knowledge is sharing it with others. There's a zakat on time, which is giving other people some of your time. Right? Whether they're your family members, your friends, your spouse, etc. Okay? There's a zakat on wealth, being generous with one's wealth as well. 
Okay? With regards to chivalry, there's a few things that we should avoid. Being a coward, and this is directly, like I said, from the book. He says, being a coward, especially when defending the truth. This is completely the opposite of being chivalrous. If you're a seeker of knowledge, remember, this is about seeking knowledge. If you're a seeker of knowledge, you shouldn't be afraid of the truth. Because that's what you seek. That's what you've dedicated your whole life to. And so a person should never be a coward, even when trying to defend the truth. You can't be. <clears throat> this story happened to us back in Utah. Um, we came in the morning, Fajr prayer, um, and there was a book that was half burnt in front of the masjid in the morning. One of the brothers found it. And it happened to be an English copy of the Qur'an. Somebody half burnt it, wrote some very hateful things inside, very vulgar things inside, and then it smelled really bad. They did something to it. Yani they completely desecrated this book. But it was an English copy of the Qur'an. And so the brother found it. We're going inside to pray Fajr. I was leading the Salah. And this guy brings it inside and he starts to uh, show it to everybody. Look, look what I found. Look at what they've done. Look at it. I told him, no, 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 sit down. Give it to me. I took it from him. It's okay. Nobody needs to see it. Nobody needs to know what's written inside. He's like, no, I'm going to read what's written inside. I'm like, no, no, no. You're not going to read anything. That's what they want. We're not going to even dignify what they wrote with even our eyes. I took it from him and I disposed of it properly. Which is what? Well, how do we dispose of it properly? Burn it. We burn it. I took it outside. I asked one of the brothers who, who was a smoker. He was the only smoker that we had at the masjid, there at, yeah, at Fajr time. And I'm like, this is the one time when your smoking came in handy. Give me. <laughs> I took his lighter. I lit it up. We burnt it. And then the ashes, I buried them right there next to the masjid. That's it. This was on a Wednesday. On Friday, one of the people in our community, he has a lot of connections with state legislators, the media, all these things. And he heard about what happened. And he was like, I want to know who burnt it, who got rid of it. So then some brothers came to me and were like, hey, he wants to talk to you. I was like, what's going on? He was like, he's upset, you know what I mean? Because he wanted to use this as evidence, blah, blah, blah. I went up to him, and other people are standing there. They're afraid of this guy because of his wealth and his status, right? Um, and he's like, what happened? What did you do? And I'm like, one, two, and three happened, and I burnt it the way that you know, we should do with something like this. It's like, you shouldn't have burnt it, all these things. You should have kept it. I'm like, look, look. You think I should have kept it? That's fine. I burnt it because this is what we're supposed to do when something like this happens. We just get rid of it. It's not that big of a deal. We can move on. And he's like, okay. He left. The people around started criticizing me that I should have agreed with him. Because he is who he is. He has the status. He has this wealth. I need to go along with him. Apologize for what I did. Whatever, whatever, whatever. I told them, no. I <laughs> believe that what I did was correct. I don't have to apologize to anybody. I don't care how much money or how much status or how much whatever they have. And subhanAllah, I'll tell you later on, he actually had more respect for me than those other people who are trying to kiss up to him. Because you know, they keep on telling him yes to everything and they can't yeah, and they stand up for the truth even though it might not be yeah, in their best interest to do so. Right? And, he, and I did this. And I remember at the time a lot of people were criticizing me and I started thinking maybe they're right in their criticism, but then I realized, no, 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 I need to stay firm on the truth, no matter what. And this is how every Muslim, yani, I think we should behave in general. So if we know that what we're doing is the truth, we should stand up for it no matter what, yani, inshallah ta'ala. That's just as an example, just, yani. Tayyib. A seeker of knowledge should not be quickly irritated or impatient, because a lot of times in seeking knowledge, what happens, is that we get tested, we get challenged. People who have different viewpoints. And sometimes people will challenge you just to test you and to test your patience. And you need to realize those situations and not give in to being impatient. Not give in to being impatient, not give in to being irritated. Wallah, you'll see this. Some people will try to irritate you. And you'll come and yeah, that's fine. People do this all the time. They'll come up to me and they're like, Sheikh, I don't agree with something that you said in the khutbah. 
Very good. Let's come here. Let's discuss it. No, you should have done this. You should have done this. Why did you do this? Blah, blah, blah. Like, look, it's okay. Come. You have to always be patient. Always. Even if they're criticizing you personally. You can't take anything personally. Especially if you're a seeker of knowledge. You have to be accommodating and patient. Be like, yes, brother. But would you like to see like, where I was coming from? Do you understand this? Do you agree with me on this? Find common ground and go from there. And some people will come and they have no point. Their whole point is to irritate you and be impatient. Okay? I started after an incident. This happened, I think, in 2007. It's about 10 years ago. I gave a khutbah. And in 2006, there was a sheikh who gave me good advice. He told me, try to record every khutbah that you give. Because he says, eventually somebody will lie about something that you've said. Eventually it will happen. I said, Jazakallah khair. I'm like, man, I'm thinking, do I have to buy a recorder or whatnot? And at the time, uh, some of the smartphones came out. Once I got an iPhone, I recorded every khutbah. I have every khutbah that I've recorded in the last yani, nine, eight, nine years, recorded here on my phone. Right? Backed up, like gigabytes worth of khutbahs. Just so that, I've never listened to them, I don't listen to them, <laughs> but I have them recorded just in case. And subhanAllah, just about a year or two after he gave me that piece of advice, somebody came to me, uh, and they're like, why did you say this? And you accuse them. I'm like, whoa, 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 I never said any of those things. No, you said them in your khutbah, and I'm going to go to the board, and I'm going to go and talk to them, all these things. Man, the heck does this guy want? I didn't reply. I'm like, listen, I'll send you the audio, and I'll send the board the audio, and then that's it. I said, so the board then sends me an email, because this guy evidently was pissed. So they send me an email, they're like, you've said these things in the khutbah, why did you say them? I'm like, look, here's the khutbah, listen to it, and then let me know. I sent it to them, I never heard back from either person. Right? Even the board, he was like, khala. And when I saw him later on, the head of the board at the time, he passed away, Allah Arhamu, about a year ago. That, that head of the board at the time. May Allah have mercy upon him. He, at the time, came to me like a week later when he came and visited the masjid. And he, I, I was like, did you listen to the khutbah? He's like, yeah, brother, it's okay. <laughs> I don't even think he listened to it. But the fact that I sent it, obviously he would know that, okay, clearly he didn't say that because he just sent us the evidence. But even then, he can listen to it and whatnot. Okay? So people might try to do that. They try to get on your nerves for no reason. You have to be calm and patient. You cannot be brash or impudent. You have to always be respectful. Because the thing is, as a seeker of knowledge, you represent that knowledge that you seek. And so if you yourself are brash, you're blunt, then people will associate that with the knowledge. And this will turn many people away from the knowledge. It will turn many people away from that knowledge if you yourself don't represent it. And obviously a person has to avoid being stingy and cheap. You cannot be stingy, you cannot be cheap. You have to be generous, you have to be all these things. Very good? Tayyib. We have the regalia next of frugality. Meaning, in English this means being frugal. Being frugal is where you live within your means. You're abandoning luxury. Right? You're, you're, you're maintaining a very basic lifestyle. Your needs. Not necessarily your wants or what you think you want, but you're being frugal. This is in, in Arabic, he says, Hajr tanahum, meaning abandoning luxuriousness. You're not trying to be luxurious in anything that you do. And there are some reasons for this. And so, inshallah ta'ala, we're going to go over these. Okay? Frugality means that a person lives within or even below one's means. We have a hadith of the Prophet where he says, Al-Badadatu min al-Iman. It means, Badada, here means simplicity or minimalism is a part of faith. Because the person is living a very basic lifestyle. Your, your goal in life isn't to buy the fanciest couch. Right? They had the, the, the interview with a lot of these wealthy people in New York City, in the New York Times. And many of them, the lady was like, before I got the couch shipped to my house, I had to remove the price tag because the price of the couch, and this was the second couch that we got this year. They replaced couches twice a year, this lady. This couch, just this one couch that fit two people 
was more than my maid's salary. And so she said that we had them remove the price tags and whatnot. And imagine, any that. And then she sits on it for just six months and she's like, oh, I'm bored of this couch, I need to buy another one. This happens, this is real. And that's just with a couch, let alone the rug, let alone the painting on the wall, the vase that's sitting over there, the Mash'araf Ish, all these things, okay? The Arabic word entails a minimalist, minimalistic worldview and living simply within one's means. Umar radiallahu anhu has said the following, إِيَّاكُمْ وَالتَّنَعُمْ وَزِيُّ الْعَجَمْ وَتَمَعْدَدُوا وَخْشَوْشِنُوا So uh, this, he says, Umar has said, Beware of luxury and the uniforms of the non-Arabs. Be like Ma'd, and Ma'd is a forefather of the Arabs, and be rough. We're going to explain all of this, by the way. This, doesn't, this isn't racist, just so that you know, when he says the uniforms. Because it doesn't say the clothing, he says the uniforms. Is there a difference between clothing and uniform? Yes. Yes, yes a uniform represents a certain person or a certain work field or whatnot. So a priest has a uniform. That's why he's saying like avoid their uniforms, meaning the clothing that they become well known for. And that's obviously why in clothing we should wear clothing that's universal or Muslim specific. But clothing that's known, this is a uniform for like this type of people, then we should avoid that completely. Make sense? Unless we're obviously in that profession. And then he says, Tama'dadu, Tama'dadu, which means be like Ma'd. Ma'd is, his name is Ma'd ibn Adnan. Adnan is the great, 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 and he's an ancestor of the Prophet ﷺ. He's one of the children of Ismail. Some people say that he, Adnan, is Ismail, but this seems to be far. Adnan is the father of many of these prominent Arab tribes. And most of the Arab al Musta'riba, what we call Arab al Musta'riba, their father is Adnan, and Ma'd is the son of Adnan. Ma'd was very well known, even generations later, for being, for being very basic in his lifestyle. I Meaning he just had a cloak on that's made from animal skin, wore basic clothing and whatnot. And Umar who is saying, be like your forefather Ma'd, meaning in his behavior, in his clothing especially, and then be rough and tough. He's saying, be rough and tough. So now we're going to discuss what does this actually mean. First off, does luxury last? No, does not. Today you're wealthy, tomorrow might be poor. And that actually puts a lot of people in difficulty if they grow up or if they become so used to living a luxurious lifestyle, it is very hard to go back to living a very basic uh, living. Extremely difficult. And this is why he's saying, Umar who his point was, luxury doesn't last. And that a person should never rely on luxury, and it should never be his goal anyways, and that a person should always live as basically as they can. Now obviously comfortably, but by comfort we don't mean going beyond means. We mean that you're living as basically as you can. Okay? How is toughness related to the seeker? If you're a seeker of knowledge, this means that you're traveling a path that sometimes can be difficult. Sitting in a lecture for an hour, right, is difficult for some people versus yani, sitting at home doing something else or watching a movie and whatnot. So, there are difficulties that we face. Traveling for the sake of knowledge, having patience for the sake of knowledge, being patient for the sake of knowledge. All of these entail that we ourselves have to be doing those other things in our lives anyways. Okay? This is why he actually says the story, and this story I've seen it myself. Imagine we have two hikers. We're hiking up a mountain. One person is used to walking all the time. Both people have never hiked a mountain before. One person is used to walking all the time. One person never walks. And wherever they go, they always park in the closest parking spot to the building. Then they walk out and they go into the building. Then they sit at the first chair that they see. They're sitting all day. They're barely walking. And these two people then try to hike up the mountain. Who's going to hike better? Of course. Guess what? We went hiking one time with a group of youth, and there was an elder guy. And he's, when I say an elder, and he's in his 50s easily. Right? And there's a young guy in his 20s, well, like a college student. 
The college student doesn't move at all. And in his whole day. Uh, and the 50 year old walks everywhere that he can. And we went hiking to a lake up in Utah, up the mountain. Who do you think got to the end? And who stopped? Who gave up completely? Like collapsed on the trail and said, Khalas, I need a stretcher. You guys need to come and carry me. It was the college student. He gave up. And I'm looking at him. I'm like, dude, you're younger than I am. You should be, and you're racing up the mountain, and what's wrong with you? He's like, I'm not used to this. He wants to get to the lake now. The lake at the end is very beautiful. Yeah, and the place where we actually got to is amazing. What's hilarious is that this kid, the, the college kid, he was like, well, I want to eat some watermelon up there. So he was carrying a watermelon with him. Uh, wallahi, within, yeah, and the hike itself was about three miles, about, maybe it's a two and a half, but there's an elevation gain of about 3,000 feet. Elevation gain, right? And the lake that we get to, the lake up there, the lake is frozen seven to eight months out of the year. And for about four months in the summer, it, it's not frozen, it thaws out, and then it becomes very lush and green, and there's trees and all these things. But for the half the year, it's frozen over because it's so high elevation. But you get up there and it's beautiful. I mean, the lake, the quality of the water is pristine. You can drink out of it almost. You know, I, I wouldn't recommend it, but yeah, in a little bit. Um, and it's amazing. And this kid was like bringing a watermelon in a bag on his back and he's walking. He abandoned the watermelon. He didn't tell us. He left the watermelon on the side of the road, on the side of the hike, the trail, there's a little trail. He just left it there. And then little by little, he was leaving other stuff because he couldn't carry it with him. And when we came back down, we're like, dude, what? Yeah, and when we got up, and he eventually came like an hour later. We're there, we ate, we finished, and then he showed up late. And we're like, where's the watermelon? He's like, man, khalas. Yeah, and the animals, yeah, and I hope the deer is going to come and find a watermelon and eat it. Yeah, and he's completely has given up on the idea. The point being is that even if you're young and you're youthful, if you're not used to traversing that difficult path, you won't be able to do it. And the idea of abandoning luxury is that you train yourself to face other difficulties in your life. This is why, for example, the Prophet ﷺ was commanded to do, this is one of the readings into these verses, Allahu A'lam, because it doesn't explicitly say this. Okay, this is a tadabbur in the verse. In, in, um, in, in, in the beginning of Islam, the Prophet ﷺ was commanded him and the Sahaba to stand at night in prayer, in salah. While they were in Mecca. In Mecca, there's nothing going on. There's some persecution, there's whatnot, but they're ordered to stand up in prayer for hours. And it's as if later on, when they go to Medina, this requirement is lifted, right before they go to Medina. The requirement is lifted. But it's as if Allah was training them so that later when they stand in battle for hours, they're completely able to do it. Because they're already used to standing for hours on end in front of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So standing on the battlefield was not a problem. Training for that idea, training for that, yani, that you're going to traverse now a very difficult path. You're going to try to protect Islam and defend Islam. That needs preparation ahead of time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No. No, no, no. I'm not saying it's not good to have AC or anything like this. No, no, no. Relax. A person needs to protect themselves. But we'll get, we'll get into... Uh, let me finish the slide and then we'll answer your question. We're, you're getting a little bit ahead. Okay? So because of this, there's a difference between a person who's used to hard work and a person who's never worked a day in their life. Do you guys agree with this? Without a doubt. Okay? A person who's worked and is used to hard work is obviously going to be very different than a person who's never worked a day in their life. The Prophet ﷺ walked around and recommended other people to walk around what? Barefoot. He called it al-ihtifa. Kana Rasulullah ya'muruna bil-ihtifa. Al-ihtifa is walking around barefoot. Even outside. And so sometimes the Prophet ﷺ would walk outside barefoot. Why did he do this? To, due to a lack of shoes? No. Yeah, to be rough. A little bit. Just a little rough. There are some people who, they cannot even walk barefoot in their own houses. They're so used to walking in cushioned, 
slippers, memory foam, sharif ish, all these things, right? Where they can't handle even a little bit of roughness, a little bit of toughness. Can a person be too rough? Yes. <laughs> Where it becomes detrimental, it becomes harmful. Like the person says, you know what, I'm going to be rough and tough, I'm going to walk, go walk outside in the snow. You know what I mean? I'm just going to continue, no, 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 barefoot. There was a guy, I met him in Utah, back in Utah. He was a convert, and he would walk around barefoot everywhere. And if you look at his feet, man, I was like, man, you can't even come into the masjid, dude. Like you need to take your feet off outside. <laughs> I'm serious, wallah. <laughs> okay? And I, we told him, go wash your feet and all these things, and he would wash them and they'd be discussing. Umar knows who I'm talking about too. <laughs> right? That's too much. Like if you look at his feet, wallah, they're rougher on the bottom than shoes. Yeah. And there are people that when you shake their hands, because of how much hard work they do outside, it's like you're touching a rock. Sandpaper. You guys have, every, everybody's had that person, right? But then there's some people that you shake their hands, even men, and you're like, man, your hand is softer than my wife's. Like, what the heck is going on here? <laughs> This person uses too much lotion, or you, you know what I mean? Like, uh, hand sanitizer. I don't know what's going on. So, a person needs to be a little bit rough. Do some sort of hard work. Teach yourself, discipline yourself, in order to face other difficulties, because it's all related. This is why we said, it helps build tolerance to difficult situations. It helps shape your attitude. It makes you appreciative of the luxury. So if you indulge too much in the luxury, you become desensitized to the luxury and you don't appreciate it. We're not saying that a person shouldn't appreciate it. Like if we have AC, you can appreciate that. Alhamdulillah, we're not saying to turn it off. But what we're saying is you shouldn't go overbound to where you're looking at it and you're saying, oh, it's set at 70 degrees. No, 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 we need to put it at 71. Ya khi, handle yani the one degree difference. It's not a problem. Because sometimes you will find people who are extremely too picky and it affects their attitude. Whereas people who are used to living in 90 degree weather, even if it's 72 or 73 above the whatever, they're like, Alhamdulillah, it's fine. Compared to what I was in before, it's completely fine. And you guys know the difference, right? There's a difference in a person who's handled difficult situations and how appreciative they are of the luxury that we now enjoy and people who will be picky even about like half a degree. And they'll be completely like their attitude will be completely negative because of the difference of one degree or two degrees. Correct? So this is obviously yani, some of the points. The author actually makes this point and he says that being sheltered in luxury, okay, uh, has, uh, it leads to um, disease and sickness. Being too sheltered. And you guys, have, you guys know what I'm talking about. Sometimes we keep our kids, for example, like too bundled up and too sheltered. And as soon as they face any sort of difficulty or any temperature change, the kid gets sick. But that's because from day one they were super sheltered. And so the author is saying that we as seekers of knowledge shouldn't be super sheltered like this. We should be able to face difficulties, face... Yani, a lot of challenges and whatnot. This is, by the way, one of the reasons why um, I try to take my students, especially we used to do this all the time back in Utah, we used to take our Sunday school students uh, not only hiking on a regular basis, but also camping outside. You take those kids camping outside for just a weekend and they'll appreciate the indoors for the rest of their life. <laughs> right? Sleeping in a tent in a sleeping bag. Now even though it's a nice tent, it's better than any tent that existed at the time of the Prophet or the Sahaba. Right? We're not doing that. And we still have our car. At the end of the day, you can't go into the car. Remember we took an adult with us, one of the, the parents, and he's like, oh I can't do this, where's the car? And he turned on the car all night long with the heater, just so they can stay warm. And I'm like, dude, if you just went into your sleeping bag, waited 10 minutes, the sleeping bag would have been warm with your body heat and you would be able to fall asleep. But that 10 minutes, he could not have patience to just get into his sleeping bag and handle the cold for 10 minutes and sleep there. We, took, we, took, we went camping in some instances. We had to make wudu with water in which there was about an inch of ice that developed on the water overnight. So when we left our water outside, it was completely fine. It was warm, room temperature. And overnight, it froze over a little bit because the temperature dipped that much. But we made wudu out of it. 
What's funny is that one of my friends, he wanted to make adhan to wake everybody up. So he's making wudu out of that frozen water. He didn't dry himself. That's the secret to not getting too cold, is to dry yourself immediately afterwards because wet skin gets cold 30 times faster than dry skin. So when you dry your skin, it won't get too cold that quickly and then you can put your, 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 your jacket back on and then you're fine. You'll, your body will warm itself up because it's your extremities, not your core. Right? And so that's what we did. And um, the guy wanted to make adhan and he, his adhan, because he was shivering, was the funniest adhan I ever heard in my life. <laughs> because he was shivering, he said, Allah! <laughs> Man, you should warm yourself up, you don't need to make adhan. <laughs> but yeah. So anyways, that's about being rough and tough. Any questions about being rough and tough? How much time have we spent? Okay, that's about an hour. I have three more slides about clothing. But clothing is going to open up a big can of worms about luxury when it comes to clothing. Right? And there's at least three slides and we can do even more. But I'm going to stop here inshallah ta'ala because that's going to be a long discussion. Um, anybody have any questions about being, about being like rough like what Umar anhu said? Yes? Yeah, so about, I mean, here's the thing. You shouldn't, like, let's say, for example, you're in your house. You shouldn't turn off your AC completely and then risk overheat and over exhaustion and whatnot out of a sense of trying to be rough, right? If you have it, alhamdulillah, come standard, this is great. But what we shouldn't do is becoming too picky with it or too reliant upon it. So when it's not there, we're not going to die. And when it's there, we're thankful, alhamdulillah. Umar al-Anhu, his point was that we don't rely on the luxury. We can rely on the basics and that's enough for us. And that when the luxury happens, we're thankful for it. But that we never rely on the luxury. Because there are people who rely on the luxury and then they don't know what to do. So luxury, for example, is having a driver, a personal driver, or having a maid, or having a cook. In many Muslim countries, especially when I went to the Gulf area, the standard is now, and this only happened within the last 50 years, everybody has a maid, Everybody has a cook, everybody has a driver. And that's luxury. And now they've grown so accustomed to it that they can't live without a maid or a cook or a driver when everyone else in the world is living without all of these things. You understand what I'm saying? Is that you appreciate that name. And now if you look at their forefathers, any of their parents, when they first got it, when they first got the maid, they were appreciative of the maid. Because they understood what she's actually doing for us in the house. And before I was cleaning by myself, but now I'm able to do other things and whatnot. But now this new generation is growing up, and the only thing they've ever seen is the maid. And they don't know what life is without it. And they've now come to rely on the luxury to where they can't live without it. And that's what Umar was very careful of. He didn't want us to rely on the luxury. He wanted us to be appreciative of it. That's the point, inshallah ta'ala. Yes. Uh huh. Super easy and posh lives. Yeah. So that's actually a big problem. Um, there was, I remember listening, and these are non Muslims, by the way, on the, on the radio, who were talking about, these were behavioral economists who did a study, and they found that families um, that are able to give their kids a good lifestyle, struggle with this idea all the time. And they're like, um, you know, I went through, so a lot of parents will say this, I went through a difficult childhood, I never had the things that I wanted to have, and therefore when I'm a parent and I have my kids, I'm going to give them everything that they want. Is there a problem with this thinking? Yes, there's a huge problem. And that is giving the kid everything that they want. They don't get everything that they want. Yeah. One of the hardest things to do as a parent is to tell their kids no. But in fact, telling them no, teaching them that self-discipline is extremely important in shaping their personality. Because if they get used to that instant gratification, and they get used to getting everything that they want, guess what will happen later on in their life? They're going to be disappointed. They're going to have a hard time being a functional adult. They're going to have a hard time facing the realities of this life, which is you don't get everything that, they, that you want. You're going to face some rejection. You're going to face some difficulties. And that's the point. And so if you can train your kids at an early age not to get everything that they want, to be self-disciplined, to practice self-control, to learn the benefits of hard work, 
that if you want, for example, this iPad, you have to work for it a little bit. You know what I mean? Not to give your kid a cell phone when he's only 11 years old. Right? Not to give in to the societal pressure and giving them this and this and this. Right? And that's what I... And I, I do believe... Like I, f- Me personally, I don't believe that any kid should have a cell phone until they're driving. I don't believe any kid should have a cell phone until they are driving. There, it absolutely serves no purpose whatsoever. In fact, it brings more harm than good. You have no idea the problems that we face with some of these school kids and the things that they're doing on their phones. They're way too young and the problem is a lot of times the parents not only give them the phone, but they don't give them an instruction manual. The instruction manual is sitting down with the kid and explaining to them how to use the phone properly. Say, look, on this phone you can do haram, you can do halal, you can do this, you can do that. Are you going to do it responsibly? They're not even giving them that. And even after giving them that, right, you still need to monitor it and you need to talk to them, you need to do all these things. Which is why I don't think that they should get it until yani, they're ready to drive in order for them to be safe. Best. As long as they're in the house, you can do anything you, you, know, you want to do on something else, but not a phone. That's all my personal opinion. Yani, you can put it on me. Yes? Um, <laughs> yeah, we can. Okay. Let's save that for next week. Of part of clothing now, without a doubt. Yeah, part of the clothing aspect. Let's do that. Yes. Yes. Um, there was. Um, I'll, there's a few elements that I'll mention here. One is about intentions, one is about distances, one is about a kid that the Prophet ﷺ saw. So there was a kid, a young, a young Muslim, who died in the same village where he was born. And the Prophet ﷺ said, لَيْتَهُ مَا فِي غَيْرِ أَرْضِهِ That I wish that he wouldn't have died in his own land. I Meaning he never left, he never saw the world, he never got out, he never spread Islam. This is a hadith. I need to look into its meaning more and find out its authenticity. But it is a, it is a hadith that's narrated in some of the books. Um, and the meaning is that this person never really accomplished anything. He never did anything. He never went and learned or sought out knowledge. Um, however, there is something to be said, and there are some scholars who said that the greater the distance between where you were born and when you, where you died says a lot about how much you've done in your life as well. But you have to answer to why did you travel that distance? Did you travel that distance for the sake of money? Did you travel that distance for the sake of knowledge? Did you travel that distance for the sake of spreading knowledge, of benefiting others, of giving da'wah? Did you, spread, did, you, did you travel that distance for the sake of Islam? Or did you travel that distance for the sake of luxury? You know, and a worldly benefit. So that's what you have to answer to as well. And a distance is not important as much as the intentions, inshallah ta'ala. I'll have to look, at, look up the exact wording, but it is a hadith, I remember it now. Okay, good. Any other questions, inshallah? Okay, we'll stop here, inshallah. Yes? Knowledge being beneficial knowledge. Even if it's worldly, like a person studying to be a doctor, that's still beneficial in the end because we do as a society benefit from that person's knowledge. So yeah, inshallah ta'ala. Okay. We'll stop here inshallah ta'ala and we'll continue next week with the regalia about clothing and then uh, the next regalia is about um, good, uh, uh, what's it called, company, places and avoiding commotions and fighting and whatnot inshallah ta'ala. Barakallah feekum, jazakum khair.